Sunday, June 5th, 2022, and welcome to the 17th episode in this series from Midas Touch and 5-Minute News called The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can download the show as audio in addition to my daily 5-Minute News podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Joining me today is epidemiologist, health economist and founder of the World Health Network, Eric Feigl-Ding. Eric, hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Great to have you here on uh, the weekend show. Uh, Coronavirus is a subject that obviously we're going to talk about at length, but it's also a subject that seems to be petering out and doesn't seem to be on the minds of people as much as maybe it should have uh, been or it should be. Um, What is that to do with and, and why is there this kind of lethargy associated with with COVID-19. Here we are two years on from from the uh, virus first appearing. Yeah, thanks for having me. Obviously, we are two years and a quarter into this pandemic, and it's still not ending. And it's I don't think it's going to end for a while longer. And in many ways, you know, we I, I think we've adopted a head our ostrich head in the sand approach where we we think, well, if everyone's boosted and we have all these drugs, then, hey, COVID is over because it's mild as a flu. The the truth is, um, even if it's mild as the flu, if you're boosted, let's be honest, most people are not boosted. If they were boosted, many, many of them are boosted like more than six months ago and it's been waning. And the variants have keep coming. You know, there's BA1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and there's more subtypes coming. And whatever you were previously protected against, whether um, uh, you previously have infection or you previously had vaccinations, the issue is that uh, the virus is still going to keep blowing through our population. And it's only a matter of time when the virus adapts enough we get unlucky enough by uh, allowing to infect millions and millions that we have an even more dangerous strain, a more evasive strain, more severe strain. And right now we're just kind of like in this brief lull because it's still, you know, it's still springtime. It's not deep in the summer. It's not deep in the winter. Um, so, and we still have drugs and tests available, but guess what? Drugs and tests are running out. We're, uh, you know, running out of pandemic money. Vaccines, we don't even have enough uh, in terms of funding for another whole round. Um, and these variant adapted vaccines are still six to nine months in the horizon. Um, and that's assuming that the virus doesn't keep mutating uh, before then. So I think in certain ways, things seem okay at the moment, uh, but the cases are really high and rising. We just don't know it because, again, a lot of our tests are based at home. So the data signals are a lot weaker than they used to be. And the mortality hospitalizations are lower because we do have a lot of drugs to suppress it. But we're running out and their variants are going to adapt to it. And and I think that's the problem. You know, we don't see we don't see around the corner. We see only what's in front of us. And everything is peachy, hunky dory. Um, there's oh nothing to write about. We keep plowing through, and especially with the pandemic fatigue, um, it's very convenient. Just like with climate change, it's very convenient to just pretend that it's not there. Because oftentimes the consequences for ignoring it doesn't come like right around the corner tomorrow. The consequences comes six months, a year, two years down the road. And the sad thing is, because we've just allowed this thing to keep spreading and spreading, Um, I think we're going to be living with it longer and longer. It's one of those things where short-term gain uh, is uh, actually leads to long-term pain. And I think that's the mentality, whether it's COVID, climate change, we just want to enjoy ourselves in the moment and not think about the future. And how exclusive is this to, to America? Because America has over a million deaths from COVID-19 now. And it's more per capita than any country in the world. And this is something that people don't understand. You know, they, they argue the numbers and they say, well, there's more people in America. Well, no, it's per capita. There are more people that have died from COVID-19 in the U.S. 
I, I speak as a as a British person living in the U.S. I come from a country with with socialized health care and where you know COVID tests are free and where where Not treatment anymore. is is free. <laughs> well, there yeah, obviously that is a conversation to be had. But I have probably spent maybe a thousand dollars of my own money on COVID tests since the pandemic began here in the U.S. Um, and in fact, I went for a test last week. And uh, they've sent me, a, you know, the insurance paid for some of it, but they've sent me a bill for the other half. Now, this is not sustainable because, you know, people simply cannot afford to engage with the pandemic if they're being charged to be a part of it. Do you see what I mean? It's almost like people would rather not get tested and right. carry the virus and spread the virus because they fear that now that pandemic funding has run out, they're just not going to bother getting tested. And this is why it seems it's easier to test wastewater than it is to have humans actually show up in person or test at home. Yeah. So my question really is, you know, why more deaths in America and how is America going to fare compared to the rest of the world uh, and certainly countries that do pay for their citizens to weather this pandemic? Yeah. So U.S., we exceeded a million official confirmed deaths, I think, last month. But um, we actually hit a million excess deaths, excess uh, over historical averages back in February, actually. And I think the excess deaths uh, actually tell the bigger story because, you know, confirmed deaths is only where you can you can only confirm deaths in which you test. Right. And many countries have even worse testing um, in, in many ways. So like, for example, Peru and Ecuador have some of the highest excess deaths of the pandemic. There are many other countries that, are, that are, have even worse than the U.S., I'm just saying. Um, but I agree, like many countries offered free testing and it was great while it lasted. Uh, you know, UK unfortunately stopped doing that. Continental Europe, European countries still offer it, but it's still inherently, especially in the U.S., we have such a gig economy. Right, a lot of freelance work, uh, a lot of the work aren't protected by labor laws as strictly. Um, and you know, if you're a waiter or waitress or Uber driver, if you test positive, um, a you have to isolate, and b also um, your uh, close contacts have to quarantine as well, which means they also are out of work. So there's a now there's a social network effect of if you report then I'm, I, I'm uh, screwed of a job as well. So there's inherently, just relying on self-reported testing is is not enough. And um, But if, again, if you don't test, they don't show up in the database. If you don't test officially, if you home test, they don't show up in the database. And a lot of people, I bet, test positive and still keep ignoring it. Now, why, it, did they, it, why did they create a home test that didn't have a reporting feature? I mean, yeah, that just that, seems so, so naive to me that all these people supposedly are testing at home. Biden's sending out home tests. And yet there's no I wanted to download an app and I wanted to be able to take a photograph of the test yeah. and that would ping it up to the server. And then you could gather data. I mean, surely yeah. in return for giving free tests, gathering data would have been like, you know, data mining. I mean, that, you every, would think everywhere that else they should it. do that. Actually, right. in in, uh, in Europe, they do that. Do that. Actually, if you look at some of your uh, rapid tests, they actually have a QR code on them, um, right. and they actually the QR code is actually designed for for reporting purposes. So m many other other countries that use the same rapid antigen test do have a reporting system. The U.S. very few places even had it, um, and now most states don't even report it whatsoever. It's it's a, one of those things like hmm, it's very convenient it tells you it's it relies on the american ethos of self-reliance and personal responsibility but we know how well that works in a pandemic <laughs> yeah. i think look it is unfortunate and this is why uh, you know wastewater is is much more reliable and, and people ask so oh, what does wastewater say well wastewater it's it's definitely surging nationwide and it's not as high as the omicron peak but guess what it, we're about uh, tied with the Delta wave peak um, that we previously had like late late summer last year uh, in 2021. So we're basically at the Delta wave peak in terms of wastewater. And as you know, Delta wave peak was really, really bad in terms of mortality in, in many parts of the country. Now, we're a little bit more vaccinated. We're, uh, we've got a, a lot of Omicron has blown through us. And we're a lot more boosted than we were b before. But... 
you know, the variants are very different. <clears throat> and also, I and people keep saying, you know, oh, Omicron is mild. Well, it's mild if you previously got infected or if you previously have vaccinations. So it looks looks mild, but intrinsically, it's actually no more milder um, than the original strain. It just so happens that we are obviously a lot more immunized. But but guess what? A lot of America isn't fully um, vaccinated nor boosted. And I think you definitely need to boost it. I always tell people the most important shot is your third shot because the third shot provides you the most antibody protection, way more than even two fresh shots. And I think a lot of people... I, I'm on my fourth you know, one, by the way. I, yeah. I, I got my fourth one about uh, three weeks ago. And uh, I'm not even eligible for the fourth one yet. But I, I, I looked at my... Um, calendar and I had my last booster six months ago and so I was like well I don't want to wait and I'm about to take a flight and travel and so I was thinking I just I, I want to get it I want to be as safe as possible because I'm you know almost at the threshold yeah of the and of the, a lot of, of people are doing what you're doing and yeah um, and whatnot and I, I, by here I tell people look boosters are good but the boosters we have um they're, they're protecting you against death you're not going to die so let's just use a bridge analogy. Um, the bridge is not going to collapse. So think of four-lane highway bridge. The bridge is not going to collapse. You're going to live fine. Um, but, you know, the, it reduces transmission. So you can set up four lanes. They have two lanes of your highway uh, that's closed. But that's two lanes is still open. But now the other thing is, instead of previously being cautious, people are completely not cautious anymore and going to nightclubs, restaurants, crowded bars, um, other crowded parties, right? Um, and so in certain ways, you have two lanes closed, two lanes open, but now you're putting way more traffic across <laughs> this bridge. Yeah, and it's a in very the good end, analogy. you're actually increasing your dose of exposure. You're actually right. increasing and increasing the spread. And of course, there are lots of immunocompromised people and high risk factor people. And if you actually look at the list of risk factors on the CDC website, it, if you're obese, you have a diabetes, you have any chronic disease, asthma, that covers like more than two thirds of the United States by the time you get through this 20 disease list. Uh, and people completely forget that. And oh, the CDC website says, oh, uh, if you have a, if a high risk condition, uh, talk to your doctor, which is r really nonsensical because mm -hmm. honestly, honestly, you know, Paxlovid is a great drug, um, but uh, it, it's very restricted in terms of limited access. We're running out of, uh, Money. By the way, the next batch of money that we get for the pandemic funds will be actually to repay the drug companies for the loan of many of these drugs because we right. haven't even paid for them. We're, they, we've been kind of loaned to us. It's yeah. it's a really it's a really crappy situation because you know it's the access. You know, many people have uh, who are privileged have HEPA filters in every room in their house have mm. unlimited number of tests they can do. They can have a doctor on call to get them the Paxlovid or the monoclonal antibodies, which, you know, many of them don't even work anymore against the new variants. But they have all these resources and tools to m make sure that they don't go to the hospital uh, and, and they don't die. But most of the rest of the people aren't that privileged. And, you know, they have a lot of unvaccinated friends and family. And uh, they can't afford uh, hospital bills. You know, half of America is always yeah. just like one hospital bill away from bankruptcy. And, and people that, need to work. So... I mean, that's the thing. People are living paycheck to paycheck. And so they can't take time off. So if if the advice from the CDC is go talk to your doctor, well, some people might think, well, that's going to cost me, you know, a, $150 without insurance or a $40 copay if I do have insurance. And so people are reluctant to go to the doctor. And so we're in a situation now, I presume, where we are, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy because the, the, the pandemic continues. And yet psychologically, people are like, well, I've lived with this for two years now. I'm kind of done. Or they've had two shots and they're like, well, I'm vaccinated. But obviously we know three shots now should be, it should always have been a three shot regimen. Is that right? Right. Uh, because I always tell people two shots, it puts you at some 700 antibody levels. I'm quoting Pfizer. But three shots puts you at over 2,000, 2,500. And you really need that kind of level of protection against these more evasive variants. And again, even those, even three shots does wane, but at least the waning takes a little bit longer. Look, but the protection against hospitalization and death, a severe disease with two shots, according to the UK, 
against uh, the current BA2 Omicron is about fi only 59% protection against severe disease and death with just two shots alone. It's just not enough. 59% <laughs> is good, but it's not, it's not that good. You need, uh, you need to get into the 90s. And, uh, and I think that's, that's really, really what I'm trying to offer. That, you know, during the Omicron wave, if you're boosted, you had 22 times lower death rate than someone who's unboosted uh, if you're over the age of 65. America, we never had a booster rollout, at least in the UK, uh, you know, with some of the, you know, complete lack of mitigation now. At least before, in the winter, they had a comprehensive nationwide NHS uh, booster rollout program. We never had that. We still were kind of like, oh, just try to get boosted, but we never actually required but it. But no, there is no healthcare system in America. I mean, it, no, it doesn't it's, it's exist. a complete ragtag, you know, right. a patchwork of. And but even the government didn't even have a consistent messaging. They didn't redefine fully vaccinated as three shots like Israel did. They're like, you're not fully yeah. vaxxed until you're three shot vaxxed. Like they should have put it out on like a logo on songs, on commercials, at, repeated it over and over. <laughs> right. But, but yeah. America, we just didn't do that. And it's, it's, it, we're, we're paying the price for it. Our, our death numbers, our hospitalization numbers, and our children. As, and I, oh, I always point out, there's more children who've now died in the last uh, few months than all of the previous two first years of the pandemic combined. <clears throat> and it's really atrocious. Like, and if you look at it, the children's deaths keep climbing and climbing. And of course, we don't have vaccinations for kids under five. Kids uh, five to 11 only recently got approved for boosters. And the uptake of vaccines in kids right now, even among the five to 11, which we've had since November, uh, it's about like 30% or less. It's really, There, there really was a, an article that you tweeted uh, yesterday or the day before uh, from Inside Medicine, uh, a bulletin page. It said Delta and Omicron killed far more children than flu ever does. Uh, new data shows that COVID-19 is far worse for children than seasonal influenza, as long suspected. I mean, this flies in the face of a lot of people that were initially saying, oh, COVID is just the flu, you know, a bad case of the flu. And that was tragically, I mean, you know, COVID was weaponized politically, wasn't it? It was, you know, referred yeah. to as a, as a Democrat hoax and all sorts of things that basically meant that from the very beginning, there was a there was a difference between those that sat in the in the in the right wing team versus the center and left team in terms of a pandemic that doesn't see politics, a pandemic that doesn't see borders or territory. It's a worldwide pandemic. And yet, especially when it comes to children, and I have two kids, one is vaccinated because she's six and one is four and is not vaccinated because he's too young. So, you know, I'm constantly struggling taking my children out thinking, well, you know, one of them is OK, is going to be OK, and the other one isn't. And the little one wants to wear a mask least. So there's a lot of there's a lot of play here, isn't isn't it? You know, we are not a compliant society. That's the first yeah. thing. You know, America is about freedom and doing your own thing and not being told. Compared to China, of course, when we look at China and Wuhan, where the virus originated, uh, um, not confirmed, but could have originated. Some are saying Italy, of course, because that's where there was a lot of virus initially. So it could have already been in Europe long before they even realized. But the point is that China and the society in China, people are much more compliant. Their lockdown was so stringent across the whole country and they managed to contain the virus. We didn't do that here in the United States. We basically did our best. Each state handled it differently. And we now see when we look at the data that Republican states had a much higher rate of um, uh, infection and death than Democrat states. I mean, how do we come to this, Eric? It's it's incredibly sad how politically weaponized um, COVID, you know, whether it's real or not, whether it's just the flu or not, whether you need a mask or not, whether you should vaccinate or not. Every step of the way, you know, there, there was political actors who tried to use the crisis for political gain instead of stopping and thinking, hey, maybe it's in our common shared interest to stop this pandemic and, and prevent uh, infections 
and in deaths in not only our elderly, but our young people and working class. Because again, it's not just kids who you can say the risk is low, especially in the first two years, but also, you know, kids have parents and we've orphaned. And that's the official term, orphan, in terms of kids who lose caregivers, you know, thousands and tens of thousands, hundred thousands of kids because they lost parents, whether it's parents, grandparents, uh, uh, other caregiver. You know, that is that is you want to talk about mental health trauma. That is mental health trauma. But every step along the way, someone tried to politicize it for some political gain. And it's, of course, costing us tremendously, even to this day. And it's still it's still heavily politicized. And right now, you know, boost vaccination rates, booster rates are all incredibly, incredibly low in a lot of, uh, you know, uh, counties and states that are voted heavily red for Republicans. Now, at the end of the time, you know, I tell people don't ha- do not have shot in Florida. Oh, those people deserve it. They do not deserve it because in every community you have people of all spectrums of beliefs. And again, COVID mitigation should not follow whether what religious uh, background you are or what political background you are. There are innocent people and children, of course, are innocent most of all. And today, the the, the hospitalization rates of children, especially during the Delta wave and Omicron wave in the latter half of last year and over the winter, uh, has just been incredible. And they do not deserve it. So the fact that it's politicized, it's unfortunate I don't know how to rewind time. If I could rewind time, I would. Uh, we would be able to do many things uh, differently. Of course, in hindsight, it's twenty twenty. But going forward, this thing is not over. You cannot pretend to it's over. And endangering your children. You know, I also look at the school shootings recently. You know, uh, in Buffalo, nineteen kids are dead, and yet still. They, they still say, oh, oh, you know, now they say don't politicize it for any, any you know, change. It, you know, it's, it happens. It was blame is on doors or, or whatever. You know, they try to dismiss it and, and, and downplay it again and again. And I tell people, look, we need to transcend and really focus on what we can actually do to protect our kids and transcend this issue. And in many ways, vaccines are good. Vaccines need to come sooner, <clears throat> but we also need to also think about, for example, um, airborne transmission. And, you know, people don't want to wear a mask or wear vaccines, a lot of people, but airborne transmission in terms of opening windows, that should be politically agnostic. Installing uh, HEPA filters or, uh, or UV, upper air UV, that can disinfect every room when you walk in without even doing anything, that should have been like... From day one, if you want to make it non-political, you should have installed airborne precautions from day one as well. And it's not too late. We can still do that because, of course, it's not just cases, hospitalization, death, but it's also the long COVID. From 10 to 30 percent of people suffering long COVID, <clears throat> you know, I even have a uh, cough myself after six weeks having COVID. Um, I think we need to invest in that. And again, look around the corner not just what's in front of you. Because springtime is always the lowest rates of COVID because the weather is great. You don't need to congregate inside uh, or uh, for the heat or the air conditioning. But it, this is literally a calm, a lull between the storm, between the but, but waves. But people the aren't going to do anything, Eric, are they? I mean, let's, let's you know, <laughs> talk in brass tacks here. People are done with this. And they honestly feel like it was something that they joined in with for the first few months. I mean, Donald Trump only joined in with this for the first three months. You may remember because there was an election the year of the of the pandemic starting. And in his mind, he was like, I need to focus on electioneering. And so he really only gave in terms of himself showing up for briefings and taking an interest in it was three months. And then it got handed over to, to uh, Fauci and, and, and his team. And, and I, th- I fear that this lethargy, when we see it coming from the top, I mean, even the media, and it's fine for us to be very critical of the media on this show, but they've given up too. I mean, they know that COVID is not going to sell advertising now. The it's White like House they're, Correspondents' they're, Dinner. They're, they're uh, done with it. The, the, the epidemic, yeah. Uh, I, I, I found it interesting that Trevor Noah, when he was presenting the White House Correspondents' Dinner, he says, did you guys not learn anything about the gridiron dinner? No, no. 
And, uh, you know, there was actually quite an outbreak at the White House Correspondence Center, but right. it's, it's not reported because White House Correspondence Center is the Journalism Industry Trade Association <laughs> Center. <laughs> yeah. You know, no one wants to report bad news from it. Um, but this is very serious, isn't it? Let's be clear. It, it I mean, is, this is, it is very, so very, serious very serious. Because they're, everyone there, there's no death from the dinner because everyone there is incredibly privileged. That's why yeah. they're there. <clears throat> but the everyday Americans who, you know, for example, airline cancellations. There are 7,000 flights canceled this past weekend alone worldwide. Now, obviously, air traffic control and other things, uh, they're influenced. But you know, the airlines even admit, Delta even admits that, oh, we've had staffing issues due to COVID and causing absences. But, you know, if you watch what happened with British Airways uh, and EasyJet back in April, that was exactly what happened in the Heathrow. Uh, like the absences that happened, it's not just pilots and flight attendants, but baggage handlers, a- airport staff. And, you know, when we suddenly threw the doors open, removed the mask, which, by the way, was a judge who ruled on it. Kind of crazy how this can happen. Um, basically, we said, you know, next month, uh, you know, Memorial Day, we're going to see the same thing. And, of course, the can- cancellations pile up. Um, you know, you can easily say that there were several thousand or at least a couple hundred cancellations. But what, why have airlines, it's a very good point that you bring up, you know, you're, you're right. The CDC basically said keep masks. A Trump appointed judge ruled against that. Um, and, the, and the CDC said we're not going to fight that ruling. And then airlines immediately dropped their masking policies. Now, Surely the airlines would want to take the advice of the CDC over a Trump appointed judge who's like very anti COVID and, and pro pro freedom. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't because I'm about to take an 11 hour flight in, in just a few hours. So I'm thinking about this and I, I checked and they have no mask policy. I've bought myself a, uh, a US made uh, N95. You know, it wasn't cheap, but I'm going to be completely masked. I have a feeling I'm going to be the only person on this aeroplane full of 350 people who, who is wearing a mask what is, and who has had four, four vaccines. I mean, why is it that I, because I read, I guess, and because it's my job to, to kind of get my head around the, the news cycle and I don't watch cable news, you know, I read the studies. So the studies that I've read about COVID all come from the universities and from the, and from the medical journals that are actually publishing these things. I want the information from the horse's mouth. I care. I have kids. I want to make sure they're safe. But what, what kind of world are we living in where the airline cannot wait to get rid of the masks are they going to sell more tickets? Do they see yeah, it as more it's, commercially again, it's, viable? It's a short-term I mean, short uh, view of the world. Oh, hey, more uh, less masks, uh, and then people think everything's returned to normal, and people will travel more. Hey, come, come fly, travel. Everything's revenue, normal. More revenue. Because it yeah. looks normal. But looks can be deceiving. And, and they say, oh, we have HEPA filters. But <clears throat> we know that. For example, back in the day, remember how uh, – 30 years ago, you could smoke on airplanes. But, you know, we always say there's no such thing as a smoke-free section of the airplane, just like there's no, you know, pee-free yeah. section of an, a pool if you urinate in it. It's It just goes everywhere. And, uh, you know, we we had studies to prove that. So, uh, and to the fact that, you know, they just ignore the fact that, you know, the HEPA filters, the air ventilation system is not enough to stop whether it's the harm of secondhand smoke or the harm of secondhand virus aerosol exposure uh it's 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 delusional it's it's completely uh gaslighting the public and you know i don't really get the airlines in terms of their short-sightedness like clearly the cancellations cause way more disruption well maybe they say well we already got your money right um in many ways you're already captive but this only hurts your industry long term and I think the fact that the CDC, the Delta Airlines, for example, wrote a letter to the CDC saying five day isolation is all we need. Please make the isolation rule only five days. And the CDC somehow complied, even against all the scientists at, uh, protesting this. Like it is insane to have only five days isolation and no testing to exit. UK at, at least at that point. Now uh, they went, went the way of the crazies as well. Had no 
at least they had two consecutive testing on day six and seven, that if you test negative on two consecutive days, then you can exit isolation early. But U.S., five days exit, and oh, if you have symptoms, but they're improving, it's okay. It was the most unscientific so thing. So how's we, we anybody supposed to trust? yelled at Walensky, how are yeah. you doing this? This is stupid. And she yeah. went ahead with it anyways. So I think many ways... Because she knew it was wrong, right? She knew in her heart of hearts that it was wrong, but she, she was knew under it was pressure wrong because I spoke politically. Because scientists who yelled at her the, yeah. the, the day before, or the two days before that, that this thing was announced, this five-day isolation rule with a no testing exit was announced. They say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Because contagiousness, as we know now, easily goes 10 days, 12 days. Uh, yeah. But she did it anyways against all the protests. And, you know, CDC so has many other she... guidelines that are horrible right now in which, you know, the, the green community levels thing, it's, yeah. it's almost always green or yellow. It's never red, right? But, the, but and, this undermines the entire uh, kind of medical fraternity. And if you lose trust, if we as a society lose trust in the CDC, because I knew when Walensky announced as the head of the CDC announced return to work after five days, I knew that that was a false statement. And I'm not, I'm not a clinician or a scientist. It was I so knew. obvious. It was yeah. so obvious. And I also could tell that she didn't really believe it herself, that she was doing it under duress. You know, there was clearly pressure that the economy is going to collapse if you keep people out of work for this long. The airline industry especially has a very hefty relationship, as you know, with the, with the US government, especially the three legacy carriers. And so we end up in a situation where people who realize this, or even people who don't realize this, are like, well, the CDC rules are irrelevant. It's just guidelines. And, and the, I guess we're living in a society where the CDC can't mandate anything. You know, vaccines were never mandated in America. They were recommended. They were only mandated for people who worked for the, for the, for the federal government or and for, for certain schools. states. We, 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 used to ma we mandated it for schools, right. although we had a very loosey-goosey, you know, conscientious objective. But even, even that was, was, was controversial. So my, my question is, how do we continue with future pandemics? And there will be more. And th if this one ever ends, I doubt it will. But how will we go forward with a centers for disease for a center for disease control and uh, prevention who are doing the work of the you know the, the the bidding of economic pressure rather than medical advice yeah I think in certain ways you know I think that's the also the greatest uh, institutional damage of the pandemic there's the pandemic obviously killed and named a lot of people but in terms of the public trust um, I think it, uh, the the CDC has really been damaged there's really good people at the CDC lots of great scientists lots of friends of mine but the issue is the leadership is clearly sh the pandemic has shown has taken away the, the smoke and mirrors and clearly there's a lot of political influence on this whether it's the Trump administration or the current I think that's the hardest to you know, to restore. Um, and I think in certain ways, I hope the CDC audit shows um, that, that it's currently finishing up soon, that it, it has a lot of things it needs to solve. I think it needs to clean house from the top. And I think um, it should be in many ways, uh, uh, even more, you know, politically independent in many ways, kind of like the FBI is, is, politically independent but we thought these these organizations were independent you know that we were led to believe that they were independent that's the whole point of having these departments run by scientists and not politicians right and 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 so what it what is rochelle walensky i mean is she is she a scientist is she an epidemiologist yeah, she's a scientist she... she's a professor of infectious disease at harvard for many years um i think the word was that she was selected because she was one of Fauci's top choices and uh, one of Fauci's long-term friends. Uh, and they wanted someone who uh, they could previously to work with. But I think, I don't think she has a lot of political experience. She has no, no political experience. And in many ways, uh, have the know-how, how to fight back against political pressure. Because right. political pressure is not something that most scientists are used to. Most scientists do their science and then, you know, publish do one interview about the result study and then move on to other grants and things. Yeah. You know, political navigation and health policy is not 
natural instinct of most scientists, and she is a career scientist. I think in many ways, uh, you know, being insulated, that's why this institutional insulation, just like the federal um, board, uh, you know, the Fed, how it's politically insulated, uh, other than whenever you make appointments, from political pressure is really, really key. And how, you know, judges have life terms. Now, I'm not saying give Walensky a life term or CDC director a life term, but there needs to be much more insulation of the CDC so that it can do its job of saving, of preventing disease prevention. Remember that C Center for Disease Control Prevention. People always forget the prevention in this title. It really needs to focus. Because, look, you can say, oh, hospitals are empty. We don't need to wear a helmet today. Hospitals are empty. You don't need a buckle seatbelt. Hospitals are empty. Oh, you can drink and drive because, oh, we have hospital beds available. No, that is not public health in any way, shape, or form. And we don't say it for any other disease or any other prevention modality. But somehow we use it as our community levels. Oh, oh, hospitals are empty right now. You don't need to wear a mask. Uh, you, you, know, you know, we don't need to take mitigation measures. Like, that's just, that's bananas. Well, we that, that came from else. the earliest part of the pandemic, didn't it? When there was this fear this is when they were building field hospitals in parking lots. Do you remember? I mean, this is the, there was a fear like, we don't know what this is. We're treating it like pneumonia. And that was actually not the way to treat COVID when it, when it first happened. They didn't really realize that, did they? It was like, uh, yeah. you know, making, putting people on ventilators arguably was not the right way to, to go. But I, I fear that there is a lot left over from that. And I think that we're in a situation now where they have learned how to treat it. And maybe this is something that we should talk about. The fact that a pandemic that is brand new, as in like a, a virus that is brand new, even scientists don't know what it is and they don't know how to treat it. And they, they need time to, to study it and to research it. And that's why when initially uh, Anthony Fauci said you don't need to wear a mask, and then the right wing media used that against him when they then said you do have to wear a mask. He was going on the information that was available to him at the time. Right. And, and the whole point of a, of a pandemic is it, a, it ebbs and flows. But B, knowledge grows over time as more testing is done, I presume. So why was it or why is it the case that we are in a situation now where we've had so much ebb and flow and we've had spikes and then it returns back again and then we've had new variants it's almost like there's so much noise that this is part of the reason why people are not able to subscribe to the recommendations and this is probably part of the reason why my I have a I have a right wing landlord who's a <laughs> Trump supporter and he refuses to get vaccinated, and he thinks Dr. Fauci should be in prison. He thinks this is all Fauci's fault. And I, and I, I try not to argue with him about it because I really like my apartment. But I recognize that there are an increasing number of people, not quite half the country, but maybe let's say a third of the country for argument's sake, that, th that have a completely different narrative about this pandemic than you or I do. They, they think that Fauci has been injecting people with this, uh, you know, some kind of potion that's going to make them vote Democrat. He, they think that he is the Antichrist. Um, and they, you know, honestly think the whole thing is a, is, a, is a hoax to kind of keep control of the population. You know, we, we are talking in a very, um, you know, measured and respectful and scientific way. But my landlord sent me an article, and I'll, I'll actually quote it because he forwards me articles all the time. He sent it from a website I won't even mention because one of these dark web places. And the headline was, Dr. Robert Malone warns parents not to have their children injected with the COVID vaccine, right? He sent me that. And I said to him, why are you sending me this? And he said, because you have kids. And I wrote back and I said, well, Dr. Robert Malone is a is a quack. He's not a real doctor. If you look him up, you know, he is literally a, a, a lunatic. And there is so much evidence out there to suggest that people like him, also Robert Kennedy, you know, of the, the Kennedy family, wrote a book uh, and tried to sell books. And so there is a whole movement. I have a, had a friend who was a former nurse, also a Democrat, who was like, mm, I'm not going to get boosted. I've read the Robert Kennedy book and he's a Democrat. So that played into the politics of the, you know, thinking that he was OK because he was from the left, which, of course, is insane. You know, Robert Kennedy is also a, 
yeah. a, a very politicized and very, you know, um, he's a liar, basically. The guy's a liar and he's trying to make money out of this. So what hope is there for America and the rest of the world if there there are people like my landlord who see Fauci, who's devoted his life to the protection of, of society? They see him as the enemy and anything that he says they will ignore. What hope is there for us whilst well, a third of the, the country the, is like I that? I think a lot of the right-wing information and disinformation machines are very powerful. The yeah. the, the bots, uh, whether it's foreign-controlled or it's domestically uh, run, it's it's very worrisome because you could spin a lie and, uh, and it will go five times around the world before the truth can even put its boots on, right? Yeah. Um, I think obviously the information uh, system that we currently live in is broken. That uh, th and there are dark web and unreliable sources that are way more viral, that are way more clickbaity than uh, generic science, which is very you know tame and very kind of measured in many ways and doesn't tend to go viral, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I try to I try to translate, I try to fight back and try to do debunking. And of course, I'm the target of a lot of uh, right wing attacks and, you know, <laughs> they're pretty nonsense. But I think I always tell people, look, there before the pandemic, I used to do a lot of cancer prevention work and, and a lot of online cancer prevention. And of course, people would accuse me of, oh, you scientists, you 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 have the cure to cancer. You're just milking it for the grant money and the big money like wait, most scientists are living hand to mouth. You know, it's yeah. not a, a rich field of, of millionaires um and but think about this if I, I point for example steve jobs steve jobs is a billionaire and he's famous and he has networked and he could and when he suffered his pancreatic cancer he could have hired you know any any paid anything in this world to get treatments to save himself you know as the ceo of apple uh, computers right um but he didn't and he still and he still died. He, and actually, he died also because he took alternative treatments instead of listening. Yeah, to the he doctors. had a holistic approach to his. To yeah, end and of I life. said, look, right. look, he's not political in many ways. He avoided politics his entire life, and he's a billionaire, and he still died. And in many ways, uh, you know that you know science and a lot of biology and like a lot of this stuff it transcends what uh, politics. You know, you can believe what you want. But at the end of the day, if even a billionaire like Steve Jobs, um, you know, couldn't find a cure or paid someone to, to get him the secret cure, there is no secret cure. <laughs> there is no conspiracy. And, and I, that argument obviously worked better in the pre-pandemic days. And the pandemic politics is so much messier. But it's, I think we have to solve the information sphere um, and stop politicizing this, even though it's you know, in politics, as you say, never let a good crisis go to waste. That's that's actually the motto in a lot of politics to yeah. get uh, policy uh, things done. And, and um, Donald Trump could have used this to actually win the election. You know, he could have been so yeah, he on could the have case actually leaned into it. And he would have actually been completely quite successful, but yeah. he didn't. He tried to play the downplaying thing, and he doubled yeah. down on it even after yeah. he knew it's one person. It's one person, they came in and they've, yeah, I remember all of that. And it made me very sad because I knew it was untrue. And I had friends in Europe who could knew that but this thing was, was getting But it's easy to believe falsehoods because they're yeah. convenient. Remember yeah. the movie Inconvenient Truth? Remember, yeah. oh, and even if it's not the, just with climate change or anything, it is so convenient to believe that it's all a big overblown thing just keep living your life. There's no crisis. You know, just stop listening to those, you know, liberals who are trying to tell you that the sky is falling about climate change. Well, sky it's like the, the Netflix COVID. show Don't Look Up, right? Which is basically played into exactly this theory that people are just so selfish fundamentally. And there is no concept of collective responsibility now. It really is every man for himself. And yeah. so we end up, and, and a pandemic requires a joined up kind of thinking in order for society to recover. Because of the, the global recover. nature and the social network nature of transmission, right? Yeah. It's, it's, I think in many ways, it's an ultimate test of our society. Can we come together 
um, to solve a, a crisis that affects us all, a clear and present danger now? And do no. we have the willpower? No. <laughs> the willpower no. to, to, to stop it now yeah. rather than let this yeah. thing fester the for no. decades? We failed. The answer is we no, failed. we failed. We failed yeah. bad. Yeah. If aliens uh, were testing us and judging us, we would completely fail right now and they would never come back. Um, and say, oh, so yeah. let, let me let me ask you a question about um, uh, uh, something very concerning, and that is monkeypox, which is uh, a new virus which is uh, out in society. Two to three hundred cases, I think, reported uh, officially, unofficially, maybe a few hundred more. Um, the CDC did actually come out and say that you know this is something to be concerned about. They they yeah. were very they chose their words very carefully, but. The problem we've got now is that people have such COVID lethargy, pandemic lethargy, that if a new virus shows up, and this is not a nice virus, I mean, it leaves you, you with these, uh, you know, horrific uh, boils on your on your skin, and it's you know a couple of weeks you're out, and if you've had, a, am I right in saying the smallpox vaccine works around seventy five percent, eighty five percent? Yeah, this smallpox vaccine works. The smallpox vaccine is a very it's a very strong reactive uh, vaccine. You know, my vaccinologist friends say if people complain about side effects from COVID vaccine. Wait till they see the side effects of the smallpox vaccine. <laughs> right. There's a monkeypox specific vaccine, um, but we only have 1,000 doses of it right now on hand. The U.S. The entire U.S. government <coughs> it was never meant for a nationwide vaccination, a mask vaccination. Look, I think the issue is there is a lot of unknowns with it. Um, it's definitely different from any other sh previous monk monkeypox strain because previous monkeypox strains never behaved like this. And it's clearly uh, taken a hold in many countries, over 300 confirmed cases, and likely we're going to break 1,000 probably in a month. Um, uh, and the issue is, of course, you know, what are we going to do about it, right? Is it just sexually transmitted or more? There's evidence that could be airborne, but it's still mostly droplet and fluid transmission. But it's, but are we going to do testing, mass testing for this? Because again, no testing, no pandemic, no epidemic. Um, and the other thing is, um, this the virus has way longer incubation time. By the time you realize you have it in two weeks or three weeks, up to three weeks, uh, you may have already passed it on, right? In many ways, that's way riskier, and you can't. It's hard to isolate for that long. And uh, and and, but in certain ways, like I. What what makes me shake my head is like, what if, what if this thing did uh, get out of control and people actually get a lot of boils and photos of people with boils on their faces? That would actually make people mask, right? Because <laughs> yeah, in, in the it, world it might, that we live in, might force people. Then people are going to go looking for a vaccine and they can't get one. Yeah, because right now we have so few, so little of it. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it's. You know, we're obviously we can ramp it up, but that will take a couple months. But, <clears throat> but in the meantime, we're in this little gray, you know, gray zone, uh, this fog of war, like we were in January and February when people said, called me a fear mongering alarmist, um, as if it's a bad word, uh, you know, today. But back then, you know, it was the dirtiest thing you can call someone. Uh, I think right now there is some concern and again it's not just monkeypox we also have the pediatric hepatitis is a phenomenon which many of us do actually think is covid related and that's still also going on there are many so let's just explain what this is because i just had my daughter vaccinated for hep a and hep b uh, she'd missed out on these vaccines because yeah, of the so pandemic it's not got a hepatitis related so it's a unexplained uh like basically uh an acute type of hepatitis not due to any he hepatitis virus. Uh, right. it's, that's they ruled out hepatitis virus, um, but this this acute liver failure. You know, we have like, you know, it's 80, 90 percent of uh, these kids um, who are hospitalized, and it's not the vaccine causing it because most of yeah. these kids are under the age of five and vaccine not even eligible. But so, there was a there was a report uh, a couple of days ago that suggested that they're now looking into strawberries, organic strawberries. That could be the cause of this. I don't know if you read that. That was sold yeah, in Trader Joe's like, and other right places. Now, is that early. true? The issue is just like the monkeypox. This is a multi-country epidemic. Whether right. it's whether it's UK, US, can, uh, you know, Canada, Asian countries. We're seeing it in Asian countries. We're seeing it worldwide. So, so a lot of people early on said, "Oh, maybe it's foodborne kind of thing." 
Well, if it's food porn, it shouldn't affect that many countries all at once, right? Right. Monkeypox. If it was just un- uniquely due to some uh, one, you know, super spreading event, it wouldn't be like affecting all these countries all at once. And by the way, like in terms of all of the worldwide cases, over 300 cases that WHO has acknowledged, vast majority of them are community transmission. So they weren't linked to some single, you know, super spreading event uh, that could have explained it. It's not, you know, some countries say, oh, we had some sort of festival. No, uh, the vast majority of cases are not due to uh, that single festival. And similarly with hepatitis, it's, it's in so many countries. But all at there once. is a common denominator, isn't there? And the common denominator, you could argue, is climate change, because climate change is the one thing that affects the whole planet. It's not something we've experienced before in our lifetime, certainly not in the last few hundred years. Yeah, I think it, climate change and there are, and there are studies, animals, l- right, there are the studies linking these things together. So are we likely to see more viruses, more pandemics? I mean, the study, I've referenced it three times now on this show in various episodes from Georgetown University Medical Center, who did a study that said, as the Earth's climate continues to warm, researchers predict wild animals will be forced to relocate their habitats, likely to regions with large human populations, dramatically increasing the risk of a viral jump jump from humans that could lead to the next pandemic. So they're basically saying, and the headline of their article is that the climate change could spark the next pandemic. Is that what we're looking at here? Because, you know, I can't think, I'm not a scientist, but I cannot think of anything else that is is affecting every country of the world other than climate change. Yeah. And also COVID right now weakening people's immunities, because there's right. a lot of argument that COVID has stricken so many people with long COVID that has made a lot of them immunocompromised. Um, yeah. And so, I, so climate change, I think, is a big long-term uh, factor here, because the encroachment of people on their habitats causes animals to evolve to be more you know human friendly more you know obviously much more droppings animal droppings that interact with our environment and more likely we pick them up and i think obviously the, the, you know the removal of, uh, of their habitats will just cause this it's it's a long term bleed right this is climate change has so many different dimensions uh, it, it is it is literally causing spillovers into everything. Just like COVID is causing spillovers into so many facets of our lives. And, but, you know, we, if we just acted early, it wouldn't have gotten, you know, gotten so widespread and problematic. But we don't have the long-term, um, you know, vision or the leadership to act in a collective interest. We always act in our local interest, whether local is our own country our own state or our own neighborhood, our own family. And, you know, until we have a society where we say, hey, you know, maybe it's better for planet Earth, you know, the only planet that we can live right now, uh, to actually stop all these calamities, stop all these hurricanes from destroying our cities and coastlines and flooding so many other countries so that uh, and coastlines that they're unlivable, maybe we should, you know, actually take a stronger measure and have better collective global governance. Because right now, the issue is nobody wants to do global governance. The UN is a very weak institution in terms of what it can do collectively. Um, and, and of course, globalists are attacked by a lot of right-wing folks for oh, being a, someone pushing globalist agenda. But there's enough proof out there now, isn't there, Eric? I mean, this is the point. The proof change, is that the, cap- change, the capitalist yes, system is mind, not... But it's not, it's not compatible, minds. is it? But not in their minds, because in terms of their, you know, uh, echo chamber, it's everything's a hoax. Everything, the, right. all, all the liberals, what they push out about climate change, about science, it's a hoax. And it's a hoax until, you know, someone dies. And even then they'll say it's a hoax. Like, But a, mi- know, a million example, people violence. have died and they're, and they're still saying it's a hoax. And, yeah, and 19 I just want kids to... have died of gun violence and they still say yeah. it's not guns. So, right. and, and they say it's violent video games, but you know, Ameri- people worldwide play American video games. They don't die of gun violence. People, yeah. li- oh, it's a violent music. People around the world listen to American music. Yeah. They don't die. And you know, people have doors that are unlocked in their schools uh, all the time. They don't have gun mass shootings. You know, uh, like people have mental health problems in every country. They don't uh, have mass shootings, right? Like 
they have a lot of the problems that we have that um, a lot of these you know gun uh, deniers uh, the, basically the, these you know anti the NRA, pro NRA people deny is it's the commonplace everywhere. But oh you know oh where there's church attendance oh Americans don't go to church enough. Well, church attendance in Europe is even lower. They don't have but more it, gun violence. It, it's a level of indoctrination that is not compatible with a modern society. And whether you're using the church and God as your as your um, uh, director, you know your, the, the direction that you choose to follow, your interpretation of, of your of your of your Bible, or whether it's just this deep rooted Second Amendment right. I agree with you. It's it is incompatible with modern society, and modern society, unfortunately, is one where uh, stuff goes badly wrong. And you know, personal responsibility is not enough. We need collective responsibility. And when it goes badly wrong, it goes badly wrong. Oftentimes, everywhere, especially in in something right, like right. Pandemic. And and a lot of people who've died of COVID have said on their deathbed, and this has been widely reported. I wish I'd have taken the vaccine. Yeah. I mean, Einstein's is that not enough? You know, is that not enough? Because we know that the vaccine doesn't stop you getting COVID or spreading it. It just stops you dying. Why hasn't that message been pushed home fast enough? And, and, and because my, my, my landlord won't get vaccinated and he's had COVID and he thinks that, you know, he's winning. And he's a 71-year-old man. And I worry that the next time he gets it and he gets a different strain, he won't be so lucky. And so we're in a situation now, and the reason we need to finish, but I, I just want to kind of finish with this. You're probably aware of United Health, the the they're the largest healthcare provider insurer, you know, in the in the U.S. Um, their profits uh, eclipsed four billion dollars in the fourth quarter last year, thanks to a strong performance in the company's health insurance business, led by Medicare growth. It said their revenue rose. Uh, 12%, $73.7 billion in the quarter compared to $65 billion the year before. These these numbers are insane, right? Think of it, $73 billion. I mean, that is an insane amount of money. Pan, a pandemic in America has been very, very profitable for these healthcare organizations. They have made, they've doubled and tripled and quadrupled their revenue and their profit in the last two to three years because people need, they, they don't have a choice. People are, people are dying of COVID and they're not getting vaccinated. Um, where are we at now, you know, in a, in a, in a country that ha, is a, a capitalist system that is allowing these companies to make huge profits and yet no one speaks about it. I mean, United Health is still making a fortune. Even if I go to my doctor and I go for a COVID test, even when it was free, if if the doctor came in because I said I had symptoms, the doctor just came in and said, are you OK? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. And the doctor left again. They were in the room for one minute. I saw on the receipt that it said I was charged $350 for the doctor attending and the vaccine, the, the, the COVID test was $200 and that all got paid for by the insurance company. But the doctor attending, they knew to send the doctor attending in to just to check I was okay because they knew they were going to be able to charge three hundred and fifty extra dollars for that, you know, the, the the commercialization of a pandemic is what's going to end the human race or certainly you know bring civilization yeah. to its knees. I, I've dwelled on this a lot as an epidemiologist and health con, health economist because in many ways you know health is one of those things. It's a need, not a want, and yeah. so when you need something. You will pay almost anything. I, I tell people, if you had a mother, sister, daughter, you know, or other, you know, close relative who has cancer and they need chemotherapy to live, you would pay any price. You would pay, right. pay everything that you own, all your savings, mortgage your house, you know, yeah. uh, sell your property to save their life because you love them and you need, it's a need for a chemotherapy for them to live. And in many ways, um, you know, healthcare in general is a microcosm of that. <laughs> you know, not every case is a cancer and chemotherapy situation, but it is definitely one of those things where you can companies charge $100,000 for hepatitis C treatment uh, in, in, in for one course of hepatitis C treatment. They could charge anything they want and you will pay it. 
they will charge you fifty dollars or one uh, you know a Tylenol capsule, and you will pay it. And uh, and of course, there's uh, lots of other kickback schemes. We're not even talking about big pharma, you know, profiteering off of insulin, but it's one of those things which we actually. This is where socialized medicine, societal collective medicine, is really key. And I really hope that UK keeps um, its its public uh, healthcare system, and the US will adopt as much of the public health um, mentality. Because in many ways, if we actually funded prevention. It would actually, uh, actually put a lot of uh, these healthcare disease profiteering out of business because it's the disease profiteering that's actually causing a lot of healthcare burden. If you know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but you don't make money off of the ounce of prevention, you make boatloads of money off of the pound of cure and treatments. And I think right now we've have, you know, this over medicalization. You know, doctors treat people for most part after they're sick. Public health, we prevent the sickness in the first place. But the prevention of the sickness in the first place, A, it's invisible. You know, if you save 10 lives uh, and people don't get run over uh, across the street, no one is grateful to public health for saving their lives by installing a a crosswalk signal or tunnel. But for disease, in many ways, it's easy to profit and people need healthcare on the back end to live. And when there is a need instead of a want, you know, a want, an iPhone, you can pass up, but a, a, a big screen TV, you can pass up. But when there's a need, you'll pay up the, up the wazoo for it. And I think that is lends itself to an incredible, incredible amount of abuse. And I think that's the greatest next challenge of, of public health medicine uh, yeah. in our society. And, and arguably, and finally, that's probably why there's over a million deaths in, in America. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric Feigelding. Appreciate you uh, for sharing thank your you. expertise on the show. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to The Weekend Show on YouTube or as an audio podcast and also the 5 Minute News daily podcast, which drops every morning so you can listen while you make your morning coffee. And leave an iTunes review, but only if you liked it. I'm Anthony Davis. Join me next Sunday morning with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch.